Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have grand rounds this morning. Looks like everyone's coming over from the 7 a.m. conference. Our speaker today is Dr. Awadi, our chair. Uh, he joined the University of Michigan as uh, chair of cardiac surgery in September of last year. Previously, he was the chief of cardiac surgery, co-director of the Cardiac Valve Center, and director of the Medical Device Innovation Center at the University of Virginia. Dr. Alwadi was raised in Maryland and in New Jersey. He attended an accelerated honors program in medical education at Northwestern University, where he received the awards for best overall student and top surgical student. Additionally, he was elected to the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. While completing a surgical residency at the University of Michigan, Dr. Alwadi spent two years investigating and understanding the development of aortic aneurysms. His work was recognized by the NIH and Lifeline Association and was chosen as the top research project in 2003. While at Michigan, he received the top resident and young investigator awards. He then completed his training and joined the faculty at the University of Virginia in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. Dr. Alwadi has internationally recognized expertise in mitral and aortic valve disease with vast experience in minimally invasive cardiac surgery and percutaneous transcatheter valve therapies, having performed over 600 minimally invasive procedures and roughly 3,000 heart operations. He's been invited to national and international conferences to share his expertise with novel minimally invasive approaches, valve disease, reoperative, and atrial fibrillation surgery. At Virginia, <clears throat> Dr. Alwadi was the first surgeon in the United States to perform hybrid uh, atrial fibrillation ablation, the first US surgeon to perform the mitroclip procedure and the world's first transcable T-VAR procedure. He has been the principal investigator for a novel left atrial appendage clip to prevent strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation. Dr. Alwadi served one of five core principles. Curtis, and I'm just gonna, yeah. that's enough, that's good. Thank you. I think everybody knows me and that's very, very kind. Um, so. I wanted uh, to share some thoughts, and I think when I put it on full screen, I feel like it cuts off the screen. If I let me try that again, do you guys only see part of the screen? Yes. Oh, now it's better. Okay. So, uh, I'm sorry. Now it's better. Now you can see the whole screen. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, thank you all for joining. Uh, thanks for the invitation, and thank you, Curtis, for that kind introduction. That's not necessary. These are all friends and colleagues. So I'm going to just talk about here some conflicts. I'm going to talk about what I see as the, the future of, of cardiac surgery. Nothing absolutely relevant to this, although I do work with a, you know, as a consultant for a number of companies that are uh, developing some of these technologies. So the objectives of this are first to understand what are the lost opportunities in cardiac surgery and understanding our history, I think is important for especially young surgeons to prepare themselves uh, for what I and others might think the future may be to understand the future of cardiac diseases and, and uh, what's happening in the overall population uh, of, of people in the United States and, and worldwide, to understand the benefits of new technology, and finally to understand what skills are needed for future success. So I'll start with loss opportunities uh, and go back to you know, the, the original major disruption disruptor in the field of coronary artery disease, and that's by Andreas Grunzig a German radiologist and cardiologist who formed the first uh, PCI in 1977. And his first report uh, had four cases at American Heart Association, uh, actually was shunned by cardiac surgeons, not surprisingly, maybe still is today. But we know what that ultimately has led to. And if we look at on the left side, what's happened with PCI volume, over time, and this doesn't even go back further in time where there was obviously a very rapid adoption because of its less invasive nature and rapid ability to uh, essentially cure a patient, especially in a, in a STEMI situation. And on the right, what's happened with, with cabbage volume. And again, if you go further back, there's even been a more dramatic drop. Uh, but uh, as time has gone on, maybe a slight uh, leveling to an increase due to maybe a number of things, including you know, the, the finding patients that PCI can no longer help as well as a larger patient base with the number of patients that are elderly or with coronary artery disease increasing. So the question that surgeons ask is, you know, should cardiologists attack every lesion? And that's sometimes how we feel. The reality is I think we appreciate, you know, the, the value of, of PCI as sometimes we're a big referrer of patients to PCI. Uh, 
what's another lost opportunity? Let's go back to the history of pacemakers where an engineer, Earl Backen, as you know, developed the first pacemaker. It was first implanted by a surgeon, Dr. Senning. And of course, what's happened is it led to an entire revolution of new specialists uh, that, that have really uh, taken uh, rhythm, heart rhythm technology and uh, to another level. And what's happened with pacemaker volume, evidenced by this slide with a, with a rapid increase and continued rise, along with evidence by pretty much every major EP program in the country having very long waiting lists for patients to get uh, life-saving therapies. So if we look at the national distribution of, best, uh, of cases in the STS nowadays, I thought this was interesting to see uh, because also this is very different from what we see certainly at our institution. Over 50% of cases are isolated cabbage. Uh, with about 10% being aortic valve replacement, and then a smattering of other, other cases. Obviously, if we look at our distribution, it would be very skewed in other directions with isolated cabbage being less than about 10 or 15%, really more like 10%, and other surgeries, other operations like AVR, mitral, aneurysm, taking the, the bulk of the uh, cases. And this has evolved over time due to these new technologies. If you notice, of course, pacemaker is not on there and PCI is not on here. So in terms of the, the, the take home messages, and I'll go through a list of several different things that I think the future cardiac surgeon should do or must do is first is to remember our history and what was lost. Not to, not to necessarily fret over it and complain about it, but understand we need to think differently. Second, a uh, point I want to raise is adaptability. I think this is an important uh, thing that surgeons need to, to think differently about. And with each of these points, I'm going to bring in uh, some component of, of heart disease, primarily in the valvular space, because that, that's what I'm most used to, but these certainly can apply to heart failure and coronary artery disease technologies as well. So we think about uh, aortic stenosis. We know that it's a population of elderly and there's estimates that about 7% of the population over the age of 65, which amounts to over 16 million people, have some degree of aortic stenosis. It is more likely to affect men and women. And about 80% of adults with symptomatic AS are male. So those are just a little bit of the demographics. The other thing to remember is if we look at the population in the United States, and these are all uh, important things as we think about coronary disease and valve disease and heart failure, the population is aging. Uh, it's aging uh, as the baby boomers reach uh, their 65 threshold. And there is a lot of expectation between the next five to 30 years that the number of patients with significant heart disease is really going to stress the system more than we're even seeing today. So uh, given those two, that population's aging, and the uh, uh, aortic stenosis is common in elderly. We know that aortic stenosis is a disease that has uh, afflicted many. And, and as a result, there's been a lot of investment primarily by companies in new technologies, particularly TAVR. And today in 2021, the TAVR options, I think everybody here knows well between there's open heart surgery and less invasive open heart surgery and TAVR. And TAVR can be done through many different approaches. Uh, through the groin, through the apex, through the carotid, et cetera, et cetera, where surgeons maybe have a, a different role. But even with an aortic valve replacement and through conventional ways, there's other techniques that we've evolved, including annual enlargement, which you're, every, everybody here is learning well about uh, through uh, research and investigations from our faculty. Ross procedures is getting back in vogue repairing valves when you can, when it's uh, aortic valve regurgitation. Of course, minimally invasive approaches. There was some enthusiasm for surge sutureless valves. Again, industry supported a lot of these new technologies. And then of course, combining the above options where through a minimally invasive hemisternotomy, you do a root enlargement uh, and an aortic valve. And that of course has to uh, compare against TAVR. So what is the impact of TAVR on surgeons? Should it be that we think we have to compete against it? or do we jump on the bandwagon? And I uh, you know, would request to certainly the young surgeons that we think differently. Remember what, what's happened with PCI and pacemakers, particularly PCI, that we may have fought against it as opposed to embracing it. 
and we, again, we have to think differently. What about what is the trial data show when, when you can argue how TAVR trials were designed potentially in favor for, for TAVR versus surgical AVR? There's, you know, there's certainly probably some validity to that based on the endpoints, but the reality is these are approved devices, patients want them, and there is a, a ease of recovery. And if you look at these endpoints, TAVR is favored for early mortality benefit and stroke benefit, of course, not for uh, paravalvular leak, but uh, the fact is that patients are, are requesting it. The volume of TAVR is growing. So this is a, a slide looking at national SCS data and what's the percent of, percent of patients undergoing different procedures for aortic valve disease. And of course, if you project even out to 2020, this is the most recent report from from the STS national data, but 2020, it's well over 60% uh, of patients with aortic stenosis are getting TAVR. And if you look at just isolated TAVRs, it's certainly a lot more. So again, compete or jump on the bandwagon. So as uh, physicians, most of us are used to being on a bell, looking at bell curves. And I bet the majority of the people in this audience were always on the right of the bell curve uh, when it comes to uh, you know, getting getting through school and getting to where they are today at programs like this. However, this is one curve where you don't want to be on the right, where you're laggard and, and slow to adopt new technology. So I just want to share that thought with certainly the young uh, physicians. So the second point about the future of cardiac surgeon must adapt and adopt quickly. The reality is patients will have and always will accept inferior results uh, for easier recovery. We see that with TAVR, we see that PCI, we see that certainly with, with MitraClip, that they will accept, you know, that, that maybe it's not the most perfect result, but it's an easier recovery. They can get back to work more easily. They can get back to taking care of their families more, more quickly. The third point I want to raise is developing a toolbox that is truly unbiased. So for this, I'll talk a bit about the mitral valve. And we know mitral valve disease is, is also a disease of elderly. It's also rising in, in um, prevalence over time, and we're seeing more and more patients with complex mitral valve disease. And there are estimates that over uh, roughly 10% of patients over the age of 75 have some degree of significant, significant mitral valve disease. I'll just share a couple cases and um, talk about the toolbox that I think surgeons need to develop. And this was a, first was a 77 year old uh, lady who was fairly functional and was hiking when she fractured her hip about a month and had that fixed uh, at a local hospital. She's up in the mountains, I think somewhere in Canada. She presented a month later with severe shortness of breath, uh, acute uh, uh, RVR, AFib and hypoxia. She was had, had limited mobility, had an STS score, but was really not that high surprisingly because her renal function was good. This is what her echo looked like. And uh, for those non-physicians, you can see there's a lot of regurgitation or leak into the left atrium. You can see that the jet is, is somewhat complex. There's two separate jets. So complex by lethal prolapse. And this patient uh, was, we thought about a, a mitral clip, for example, given her recovery, it would certainly be a lot easier. There was thought that we would not, we would get a very inferior result. And then this patient offered a surgical approach uh, and we were able to repair the valve. Um, and at the end, had a, a nice result with um, really a mild MR and uh, the patient recovered well. I wanna bring this up because in, in this intermediate risk population, there are clinical trials for MitraClip uh, versus surgery. Uh, there's a trial called RepairMR, which is sponsored by Abbott, uh, and that's a trial that we're a part of. And as patients, again, are seeking less invasive approaches, they will ask for, uh, for these approaches to save better recovery, less pain, uh, get back to work or lifestyle sooner. If that's not enough, the, the Cardiothoracic Surgical Trials Network just last month Approved, got, uh, got approval from the FDA and CMS for a trial called the primary trial, which is a randomized trial of mitraclip versus surgery for low risk as well for low and intermediate risk patients with degenerative disease. And this is NIH sponsored. This is another trial that we expect 
to be a part of as many of us have helped design the trial. So that's obviously one aspect of the toolbox, the surgical approaches, which I know our, our uh, trainees get a lot of experience here, potentially more than any other place in the country. On the flip side, uh, there are patients with complex uh, functional disease. This is a 78-year-old male <laughs> with a previous cabbage and low ejection fraction. Obviously, a lot of comorbidities, as kidneys were poor. You could see uh, he was in the hospital, had an STS of over 12%. And if you look at his echo, not somebody you would necessarily uh, jump to operate on. And as a result, um, we thought about other options, and, and we know the data from the COAPT clinical trial with MitroClip um, versus GDMT or mitral plus GDMT versus GDMT, which is medical therapy alone, and showing a, a very dramatic improvement in uh, reduction in hospitalization, reduction in mortality, and pretty much every uh, secondary endpoint uh, that was studied in this trial. So as a result, we offered that patient a mitral clip, actually a single device, which is a bit, uh, maybe we had planned to do more and saw a very good result. We we're able to get the patient out of the hospital. Clearly long-term, the patient patient's outcomes are gonna be quite limited based on the ventricular function that you see, but at least they were able to feel a little bit better and hopefully stay out of the hospital as the endpoints would suggest. Mitral clip is really the first tool in the toolbox and if we try to mimic surgery where we do many things to a valve, the toolbox has expanded. And, and again, we as surgeons need to adapt and be willing to uh, try and embrace these things. So the spectrum for mitral valve intervention, as surgeons, we should be uh, comfortable with all aspects from open surgery to transcatheter approaches. And we realize that we may be giving up uh, efficacy, but the invasiveness, and for certain patients, that's actually uh, a win in many ways. So the third point for the future of cardiac surgeon is that we must offer the full spectrum of therapy without bias. We cannot only have one tool in our toolbox and hit the hammer as hard as we can. We have to be able to use all the tools and learn all the tools. Next, I want to talk a bit about innovation. So one of the vexing problems that we deal with as surgeons is severe mitral annular calcification or MAC. And this is calcium deposits in the mitral valve or around the mitral valve annulus. And this makes um, surgery very high risk traditional surgery because uh, this typically causes mitral valve disease, stenosis and regurgitation, very challenging. Uh, we, we debris this as best we can and put stitches in and the, the quality of the calcium can be so variable that it can tear and, and the mortality can be quite high, even up to 50% with conventional operations. So the options that surgeons have developed are a number, and I'll talk a little bit about either of them. One is debridement of, of mitral annular calcification. Second is using some of the technologies in the transcatheter space in surgery so surgically placing a TAVR valve. And third is using some of the new technologies in clinical trials where um, transcatheter replacements allow for treatment of these patients without conventional open heart surgery. So the first is, this is a slide I borrowed from one of our residents, Dr. Alex Brescia presented our experience of using ultrasound to, uh, to emulsify the, the calcium and allow sutures to, to be placed. And this has actually been quite a game changer where the mortality has really been, been cut almost to zero uh, using this technique. And I would say that uh, Dr. Romano and Bowling have some of the largest experience of using uh, these approaches to perform safe operations in the setting of mitral annular calcification. The second is uh, surgical deployment of a sapien valve in the mitral position. And this is actually part of the clinical trial here. Um, and this can also be done, again, marrying uh, innovation and uh, concepts from transcatheter approaches to surgical approaches. And then finally, transcatheter mitral valve replacement. In this case, this is a tendine valve um, made by Abbott, although there now are devices, uh, a Medtronic device that's now allowing uh, treatment of severe mitral anter calcification with their valve called the intrepid valve. And we did one of those cases as well recently. 
So the fourth point I'd like to make is the future cardiac surgeon must be innovative. And I would argue certainly surgeons have always been innovative. That's how we've you know, learned to develop uh, many, many things that we take for granted, including the heart-lung bypass machine. We heard the other day uh, at one of our societal meetings in the past, prior to the heart-lung machine, the way to do heart surgery is you would throw a patient into an ice bucket, wait for them to cool down, and then open them up quickly and do a, do an operation without any bypass. Obviously, it took a lot of innovators and people uh, willing to have the courage to do the things that we now take for granted, including heart-lung machines, LVADs, transplants, et cetera. So surgeons have always been and must continue to be innovative, but maybe be innovative in a different way where we, we see what's happening on the catheter side and embrace it. The next point I want to mention is working as a team. So for that, I want to bring up uh, the tricuspid valve. And the tricuspid valve, from a surgeon standpoint, is the easiest valve to access and operate on. However, we do know that patients who have tricuspid valve disease that go undergo surgery have a very high mortality. From the national STS database, patients undergoing isolated tricuspid valve operations have about a 10% mortality. Why is that? That's because uh, when you have tricuspid valve disease, it typically is a marker for right ventricular dysfunction, and they ultimately suffer and die from multi-system organ failure, liver failure, renal failure, and right ventricular failure. So we love to see these patients before any of those things occur. However, many patients don't present to us until they have symptoms when these things do occur. So what are options today? for tricuspid valve uh, um, interventions in 2021. Obviously, we still have the conventional approaches of surgery. We can repair or replace the valve, but now there are a whole host of transcatheter technologies to create annuloplasty devices that are edge-to-edge -edge repair and even replacement. So here are just a couple of snapshots of what those look like. Uh, and these are actually all clinical trials that we have here at the University of Michigan today. Uh, except for CardiBand, which is, has been actually been put on hold right now. So CardiBand is an annual plasty device. Uh, the other devices are edge-to-edge -edge triclip, where we're clipping essentially the, the edges of the valve together to reduce the regurgitation. The Pascal is another device uh, that has a similar approach. And then there are two replacement technologies. So I want to just share a uh, case, and you can see um, the dramatic result. You see severe tricuspid regurgitation on the left, and with two devices, really can dramatically reduce the degree of TR. And what we see is that the vast majority of patients, when they get this kind of result, they feel dramatically better. They're out of the hospital. They go from class three to four to class one to two uh, NYHA symptoms. Unfortunately, that result is not always the case because of the degree of, uh, of tethering and severity of, of uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So replacement technologies have really taken off, and there are two devices that uh, we're involved with the replacement. This is actually um, the, our experience with the first Intrepid valve that was, that's made by Medtronic. It's a percutaneous or through a small cut down in the groin. You can see how many people are involved, surgeons, cardiologists, imagers, all working together. And we actually, I think, now have the largest experience in the EFS trial in the world uh, with this particular valve. Um, there, there's another valve we now have access to in a clinical trial, and this is uh, the Evoke. It's made by Edwards. It's similar in concept, uh, placed percutaneously through the groin. And you can see this, the dramatic results, severe tricuspid regurgitation on the left, and on the right, uh, the really uh, dramatically improved um, uh, tricuspid valve function. And I think these are gonna be game changers, and as surgeons, we have to really accept it. So the fifth point I'd like to make is that the future cardiac surgeon must work as a team. And I think that's things that, things that we've recognized in the past. We've learned that from our heart failure uh, teams working on LVAD and transplant patients. We've learned that from the TAVR teams as those technologies have been introduced uh, for treatment of aortic stenosis. We've learned that from our mitral teams uh, with new mitral technologies. And I would argue that this is the case with everything we do. It should be the case with complex electrophysiology, which I know Dr. Romano does a lot with our AP team. It should be the case with complex coronary disease, 
and we've talked about uh, creating a, a, a uh, heart team approach to that as well, which we pretty much have, but maybe more formalized in the future. The next point I, I think the surgeons need to remember is not to forget quality. You know, as we're doing uh, more complex cases and, and you know, the uh, cases we see here are a huge testament to the complexity that is out there now. We must balance, you know, the innovation and, and the ability to care for the sickest with quality. We can't take a dead patient to the OR any longer and, and realize that they're probably going to die and that it's okay. You know, everybody's looking at quality. Uh, patients are getting sicker and some of the healthier patients are now getting transcatheter approaches. We see that with, with TABR, we see that with PCI, and we're gonna ultimately see that I'm sure with mitral and tricuspid technologies. And so the patients that are coming to surgery sometimes are the ones where those transcatheter technologies didn't work or they were excluded for some reason because they're too sick or they have too many things going on. So in this environment, we have to continue to keep on, an eye out on, on our outcomes. So the, the uh, final point is that the future cardiac surgeon must also emphasize quality. Now, just a couple of thoughts I've had about, you know, wh what types of cases do we see? Uh, and if we look at what we learned from vascular surgery, and this is probably a dated slide now, but if we continue to look at what's happened to the percentage of aneurysm cases done by open surgery versus endovascular surgery, it's dramatically changed, and now I, I believe it's well under 20% of uh, straightforward AAA. Our AAAs are treated with an open repair. It's only when the anatomy is challenging. And of course, what's happened is you've, we've created sort of two different types of surgeons, ones that are very comfortable with endovascular approaches and ones that can handle the really complex approaches, and not many that can necessarily do both. And as patients are now getting in, in the cardiac space, transcatheter approaches, we're going to continue to see that. And we as surgeons need to remain specialists in both. So the future cardiac surgeon uh, should also provide quality outcomes in what's going to be uh, mounting to the sickest and most challenging patients. Now, I, as I mentioned, I focused primarily on valvular disease, but this applies really to all the diseases that we, we see in, in uh, cardiology and cardiac surgery. Obviously, there's lots of investment in, in heart failure therapies. On the top left is Eva Heart, which is a bad device that creates pulsatility. Um, there are trans uh, catheter devices, the aortics and the Abbott uh, uh, pump that essentially are percutaneous and can be placed, that can be expanded uh, across the aortic valve to a larger size and try to prevent the hemolysis that happens. And then on the right lower side is an implantable intra-aortic balloon pump called New Pulse. And all these technologies, you know, will hopefully help um, move the gap and needle. Uh, but we as surgeons, and, and for heart failure therapies, but we as surgeons must uh, adapt and be willing to try and not necessarily shun them. And if we think about cabbage, there's also uh, lots of, in, you know, thought on what's the future. And future, of course, there's lots of less invasive approaches, there's multi-arterial grafting, there's robotic, there's new technologies that are being studied like the BEST device, which I believe Michigan was an enrolling site as part of the CTSN. It's an external wrap around the around saphenous veins to try to prevent kinking and neo-intimal hyperplasia, the results of which will be presented actually at the American Heart Association meeting uh, next month. So there's lots of uh, future technologies and, and we as surgeons should try to embrace them and study them. So I'll end with this, um, you know, cardiac surgeons, especially the future cardiac surgeons and our, our legacy being our residents, you must embrace change, shouldn't shun it. It doesn't mean uh, accept everything and look at quality, but learn new approaches and operations frequently. One of the previous STS presidents, uh, Bob Guyton at Emory, his entire presidential address focused on how surgeons really should learn a new operation every every year, learn a new operation every year. So when I think about my career, I actually was having this discussion with one of our residents yesterday. I started by doing a lot of off-pump surgery. Then I was the main transplanter uh, at uh, my last institution because uh, nobody really wanted to do them if they had busy practices and the young person didn't have a busy practice. 
to evolving to TAVR as there was a, a need for that. And again, the, the established surgeons weren't really too excited about putting needles in the groin uh, to AFib surgery and ultimately mitral surgery. So you, you are willing to learn new approaches, then you will always have you know, a bright future career. The other thing I've thought about is, you know, we have to try to avoid becoming cheetahs. If you actually Google the most over-specialized animal, it's actually the cheetah. The cheetah does one thing really well, runs very quickly for a very short time. And while that has worked in the past, as the food supply has become more uh, in, in uh, short order, the cheetah has become what they say is over-specialized versus other animals that are the most adaptable are things like, believe it or not, the camel and uh, the ant, the cockroach. They can essentially survive in all types of environments and they adapt. And that's what we must learn. We have to learn from our teammates. Uh, we've got great colleagues, uh, you know, in our outside, our especially in cardiologists, uh, radiologists, and we have to learn and work with them. And finally, we have to lead the change. We don't have, we don't, we shouldn't wait for the change to happen and then be a laggard in, in adopting it. We should be involved in designing the change and discussing the change and studying the change. And, you know, when it comes to trials, implanting them. So with that, I will end. Uh, and I thank you for your time and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I have a question, Dr. Alwadi. Um, when you look at the ABTS numbers, um, the recent update in 2017 does include uh, PCI, uh, TAVR, and also it lumps together left heart cath, PCI, TVAR, and MitraClip all in one category. You have to do five TAVRs as surgeon and 10 as assistant. Um, you still need 25 AVRs and they have broken out the other valves. And, you know, how do you think this needs to change over time? Uh, that's a good point. I, I actually, I'll answer it. And I don't know if Dr. Romano, Jenna Romano has other thoughts from the AP, ABTS standpoint. There have been discussions about how those numbers need to evolve and should it actually almost be flipped. Uh, there was a task force that met to talk about what requirements should be for um, transcatheter procedures. And there is a push at, the, at those society levels, do we need to push harder on those requirements to get our trainees more prepared? And you, you can argue pretty quickly uh, that you'll see in the next five or 10 years, it, the numbers will be totally different where probably 25 tavers and five, five operations. I'm not saying that five is enough to get comfortable, but it might be all that surgeons get in their training. So yeah, going off to your point, there is a new cardiac track that's been approved with a new case list. It's not anticipated similar to the thoracic track that every training program will be able to offer that experience. But the premier institutions that are leading the way in terms of transcatheter therapies and advanced structural heart disease should be able to provide these. So basically, the numbers of wire-based, minimally invasive, and other procedures has been dramatically increased. And there's been a, commens a commensurate decrease in some of the complex thoracic surgical procedures. There's actually similarly going to be, probably in the coming years, a review of the thoracic surgery numbers, just as the complexity within thoracic surgery has changed. And is including a lot more minimally invasive procedures and other experiences, including um, endoscopy and uh, endoscopic ultrasound. So we're going to be seeing changes on both sides, but they'll still always be the traditional cardiothoracic track, which is what we currently know now that is more of a balanced view between thoracic and cardiac. Thank you, Jenna. Good insights. Dr. Pransky. Um, Gar, that was just terrific. Thank you. I have two questions, um, a scientific one and a clinical one. On the science side, um, uh, I didn't realize you were emulsifying um, MAC. And I'm just wondering, do you collect those specimens if people want to do RNA-seq or do other things? Um, is that easily done? Uh, great question. Actually, uh, one of my um, colleagues in the lab, Dr. Salmon, uh, Morgan Salmon, uh, is, is actually working through CHIP to try to create a process to collect that tissue and have finalize that yet, but I do think it'd be very beneficial. It's something that I think many of us would like to study. Oh, that would be terrific. So hopefully, hopefully within the next few months. 
Yeah, may, maybe maybe Dr. Salmon and Dr. Sutton could could join forces because she's studying uh, calcification at a mechanistic level, both uh, mostly of vessels but also of of valves. So. Um, uh, that would be a terrific collaboration just to, to yep. suggest it. On, on the clinical side, can you give me your perspective on stenting versus uh, cabbage for left main stenosis? Yeah. So if we look at uh, various trials, XL, Syntax, and there, there had uh, early on, it looked like the outcomes were better or at least equivalent with stenting because of the complications that obviously occur with cabbage, neurologic stroke, um, those types of things and the recovery involved. As the longer term data has evolved, it seems to be there's, there's a, a crossing point at about somewhere between two and three years, such that if a patient in my, you know, my summary of, of looking at the data is if patients expected to live more than about two to three years, uh, and they have a reasonable risk of the surgery that they're going to recover. They're not, you know, in a wheelchair on oxygen and have other issues that I, I think that there's probably a longer term benefit is the, the summary of the, the data that I see with cabbage over PCI. If it's less than that, if they have, you know, another illness, they're really frail, they have a cancer that, you know, the life expectancy is a little bit more indeterminate, then absolutely it makes a lot of sense um, in my view to, to perform PCI. Thank you. That's that's great because because I struggle with uh, with that equipoise. Appreciate it, Dr. Eagle. Laura, well, uh, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed your talk and uh, really admire uh, the leadership that you're bringing to our cardiac surgery department. One of the interesting things historically about our department is that the subspecialization of our faculty 25, 30 years ago allowed us to not only survive, but flourish in the cardiac surgery space. Uh, and, and so the, the notion of cheetah versus, you know, a new operation every year is sort of an interesting conundrum from my point of view. And how, how do you and your colleagues in the department plan to maintain excellence, I mean, true excellence in certain space? Are you going to divide by the valve? Are you going to how, how do you imagine the next 10 years going, deploying the excellent faculty you have with all of the new toys and tools and trials to, to maintain that excellence, to not have everybody do three of these a year, which probably is not what we want to do? Love to hear your vision about that. Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I think there's obviously nuances to the statements that I made in, in the sense of learning a new operation. There's so much investment in new technologies in all aspects of, of cardiac disease and cardiac surgery. We, I could have had the whole talk on heart failure that would have brought out the same points. And so the heart failure surgeons should embrace you know, that disease and think about the new technologies, including probably learning the, the percutaneous approaches. Um, similar to, you know, I'm not, I don't think the future of, of a coronary specialist is, uh, surgeon is going to include PCI necessarily, because it's, you know, obviously you have to do it a lot to be, to be very good at it, but um, certainly on the valve side and aortic and mitral here, you can see that there, there's enough volume, enough subspecializations that the, the same people aren't doing both. That, of course, is unique, you know, that, that to larger centers such as ours, other centers, people kind of do both. So I, I would foresee in our uh, environment here with the types of expertise we have that are very deep within within these buckets that they're gonna learn a new procedure in that space or evolve the procedure in the space. Even if it's conventional surgery, you know, doing a, uh, advancing a new root enlargement or doing a Ross operation is still in the space. And there, there are probably subtleties and uh, the surgeons in the aortic space can tell you that there, there are subtleties for those procedures, those operations to even make it better now that our surgeons are thinking about. So, you know, although it's not a, dramatic shift of a new operation, it's evolution that we should still be embracing. Thank you. Gaurav, this is, uh, this is Donnie. Um, I wonder if you could say how different your vision for the future of cardiac surgery would be if you gave this talk at a community hospital. So I wonder what would your vision be for 
cardiac surgery at a community hospital that doesn't have the resources and the, the multidisciplinary talent uh, of an academic institution. Yeah, there's, that's, that's a great point, Donnie. Um, we're fortunate and major academic centers are fortunate to have access to all these technologies, but, but a couple things, you know, uh, that come to mind. One is the community hospitals recently and in the future will continue to struggle because of a couple moving forces. One is the workforce shortage of cardiac surgeons. And I have a whole talk on, on that as well. There's lots of publications from the ACGME that the number of cardiac surgeons is in short order, especially if you superimpose those slides I said about the aging population, the number of patients with with heart disease dramatically increasing, that their projections that roughly the workforce shortage will be between 30 and 50% over the next several decades. So that's putting a lot of pressure on the smaller community hospitals. And I think we all know programs around here where there's kind of a revolving door of, of surgeons because they're either not getting the volume or the support or their outcomes are, are inadequate because of the system, not necessarily because of, of their own skill per se. And you, you superimpose that with um, the uh, out, out uh, pushing out of technology as it becomes more accepted and think what's happened to Taver. And Taver's been adopted quickly for a couple of reasons. And I think Mitre Clip will too, because one, patients want it. Two, it's easier to do than, comp, than open heart surgery. It's easier to do a Taver. It's easier to teach somebody to do a Taver than it is to teach somebody to do an aortic valve replacement. It's easier, much easier to teach somebody to do a mitral clip than do a complex mitral repair through a sternotomy, mini, robotic, especially robotic. I mean, that's a whole nother level. It's decades of, of learning. You can teach somebody how to do a mitral clip in several months if, they really, if you really put your mind to it. So those things are gonna get adopted more quickly and out in the community, they'll be embraced. So I do think some of the conversation's the same. Technology ha has already permeated into the community, driven by industry, driven by patients, driven by, by uh, implanters that want to do these procedures. And it's easier to learn than what we've done traditionally with cardiac surgeries. We've made it very hard. We've made it so hard that only I can do this. I'm that good. And it's so hard for everybody else. It's, it's the opposite when it comes to the catheter-based approaches where, where they've said, we're going to make it so easy that anybody can do it. Dr. Eagle. Um, I wanted to ask you about clinical trials. Um, I referred a patient to you not long ago uh, who, who needs his mitral valve repair, and, uh, and he was offered enrollment in a trial. It's interesting for cardiologists. This is sort of a new space for us. We're used to kind of placebo versus a new drug. But when we're dealing with maybe an operation that we've performed here for 25 years that we know is pretty low risk and excellent versus a newer but less invasive uh, procedure that, that might be just as good, but we don't have either short-term or long-term outcomes. How do you create a team around that decision-making so the patient uh, really has a, a deep knowledge to make the best choice for them? It's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a new day for us in some ways. Yeah, so I guess this gets in an approach, uh, a question about how do we approach clinical trials in general, particularly when we're comparing two very different types of procedures. And, you know, the first comes down to, do we truly have equipoise? Do we truly have equipoise? And I think that's where we have to throw some of our, our biases out and really be honest about the question. Um, and this particular trial, one trial is mitroclip versus mitral surgery, mitral repair, uh, and in, in the patient populations that is being studied, which are over 75, and I believe some of the patients that we're offering it to, including yours, might have been somebody in their 80s, we don't really know, you know, we know we can repair a valve very well surgically. We can probably do a pretty good job with, with mitral clip. I mean, we've seen some outstanding results here uh, over the last year, and even before that, I'm sure just I've seen myself how good 
our operators are, our imagers are with, with MitraClip results, and they're out of here the next day. And interestingly, again, it's the patients that are driving it. We mentioned this trial to them, and some patients, I think maybe even the one that you sent, really embraced it. They said, you know what? My family member is really ill at home. I can't afford to be out for a while. I'm very interested in this. So patients are driving it. We have to have equipoise. We have to have equipoise, not just individuals, but as a team. And to your point, we actually have a, a meeting amongst our mitral implanting team or matrix team to talk about all the different trials we have and where do they fit in? How do we decide? How do we decide which ones to do and how do we decide which ones do we truly have equipoise? Thank you. Can I ask another question here? Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for all the white space. I love, I love being able to have this conversation. It's such an important one. Can you just um, maybe share your very high altitude views of how, how we evolve in America versus how Europe cardiac surgery has evolved? I mean, are we the Galapagos where we, we have divergent evolution? Do we have convergent evolution? So what's going on with cardiac surgery in Europe? So I'll, I'll tell you my perspective, and I'm, I welcome others, including Dr. Bowling, who's recently been to, to Europe, um, even, even uh, to give his thoughts. But obviously, some of the challenges have been the regulatory process. And in the past, uh, ironically, Europe was further ahead, at least in terms of some of the, the early uh, experience with new technologies. I would argue that the heart team is much stronger in the United States than it is in Europe. In Europe, there are lots of procedures done without the, the, the knowledge of the other side and maybe not as a cohesive a group. So I think in some ways we're, we're better positioned to really study devices. We have obviously uh, with TVT, I believe have much better, more rigorous follow-up methods than the, the Europeans do, where sometimes there's follow-up and sometimes there isn't that in the, in, unless their patient's truly in a registry and even then it's not that well suited. So. I think in some ways we have lagged behind because of the regulatory process that has evolved a little bit because of our heart team approaches. There's more investment in industry and FDA to bring those devices here sooner. And as a result, I'd say we're seeing those technologies here equally early and sometimes earlier than we are in Europe. Rich Prager or Steve Bowling, you have perspectives on that as well? So I'll just say quickly that I, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, that we used to take uh, all the small companies I work with and so on like that used to go to Europe, but they don't anymore for a number of reasons. I think the heart team has impacted the United States and being very good for the United States, much better than it is in Europe. And two, I think the FDA receptivity to innovative thinking and going to EFS in the United States has changed a lot, especially in the last, say, two to five years. The ability of the FDA to understand what an EFS is and make a malleable EFS that you can make uh, changes to devices uh, on the fly is far better with the FDA now. And I think most people are pivoting away from Europe. And I'll say in the last five years with all the little companies I've had, we've either gone to Central Asia, we've gone to South America, we've not ever gone to Europe. Uh, Gaurav, I would echo uh, what Steve said from my three years with the European group with EX. What I've seen over that period of time is a dramatic change in relationships and uh, disquiet between cardiology groups, ESC and EX, and uh, movements to really get further apart rather than come together. Interesting dynamic. It's unfortunate. So, so what I'm hearing, Rich, is that we converge in America and they diverge in Europe. And they, I, I'm not sure either side likes the divergence right now, but uh, there are some barriers that were created and independence created on both sides that have possessed technology or denied technology. David, your evolutionary parallels um, are interesting. And certainly I personally hope that we don't become dinosaurs. But um, I think, you know, the, the curious thing to me is that uh, that this process for the early feasibility pathway has actually, you know, shifted more towards allowing in the United States um, more ready access for patients, for providers to uh, 
you know, uh, to, to do this early development. As a classic example of lack of coordination and leadership, CMS, on the other hand, um, went through a process where it's now difficult actually to uh, secure, you know, reimbursement for some of these early feasibility studies. And actually what has happened, um, and I don't know if it's been reversed in the last year or so, but I, I know when FDA flipped to uh, promoting this early feasibility pathway within a couple of years, there was actually much more difficulty in getting, getting um, you know, CMS to approve funding and reimbursement to hospitals for, this, uh, for these early feasibility cases. I know that from the Stenkraft, uh, the newer Stenkraft uh, designs that we've had in the past, but it is, you know, it's a big question that, that, uh, that you ask that we hope that everybody will get aligned around because we need yeah, it. That's a good point, Himanshu. There, there is a new uh, group called the Heart Valve Collaboratory, which includes uh, some physician leaders, FDA, and CMS to try to address uh, a number of issues, including what, what Himanshu raised very much to get them aligned early on. That's terrific. Just to, to share a path which many on the screen took together. When TAVR first um, hit Ann Arbor, um, there was a huge cost and we had a, as a cardiovascular center, lobby very hard for the institution to eat that cost. And that's how we became early and in, in, in the space. So um, it was together we approached the institution and it took an enlightened stance. Great point. These technologies aren't cheap. That's another message. <laughs> So great, thank you all for your time. Um, certainly it's nice to see a lot of cardiologists on to, to show that this really is a team approach here and we have lots of new devices, technologies and expertise here along the entire spectrum. So thank you all.